When the people of Egypt rose up in January and threw out the dictator who had ruled them for 30 years, it was called a Facebook revolution. We went back to Cairo last month to see what was going on eight months after this revolution, how many of the people's dreams were being fulfilled. What we found was that even though Mubarak was on trial, something Egyptians thought they'd never see, the military now in control had reinstated the dreaded emergency laws. It was arresting activists by the thousands, outlawing strikes, clamping down on journalists, and that's not all. We found that people opposing the current regime were being tortured, just as they'd been under Mubarak. The story will continue in a moment. Eight months ago, this might have been the happiest place in the world, a traffic circle named Tahrir Square, where people overthrew a dictator in 18 days. Well, the people are back again, but the happiness is gone. That's because many feel that the revolution has been taken away from them, that the army which supported them during those heady days is now saying, go ahead, demonstrate if you want to, but we are in control, as we always were. For three decades, Mubarak's generals kept him in power. But when protesters took over Tahrir Square, the soldiers stood by and let it happen. <laughs> to give you a sense of what role the military played back then and since, we'll tell you the story of one man, a student named Rami Essam. He came to the square with his guitar, started strumming like a young Bob Dylan. <laughs> Before long, he was on stage singing a song he'd made up on the spot. Down, down, Hasni Mubarak. That had never been sung before. Rami became the troubadour of the revolution, but after a week, the Mubarak regime decided to close down the show. It sent in thugs on horses and camels to empty the square. They beat up Rami, but he kept on fighting and was still there the next morning. They hit us with rocks and they shot us with guns. I had a rock in my head. Here. But I am okay. And I'm not sad. And, and we will stay here till Hosni Mubarak go away. And Rami did stay. He got back on stage, a bandaged singer serenading a bandaged audience. The protests grew, women, children, and crucially, millions of workers. Eight days later, Mubarak was gone. You must have felt happier than you'd ever felt in your life. Yes, it was a very, uh, it's, it's the happiest moment for me ever. It was the happiest moment for everyone. Egyptians were shocked at what they'd accomplished. The soldiers were treated like liberators. The generals, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, as they're called, were applauded as well. They appointed a transitional government and promised free elections in six months. Meanwhile, they kept the power. Who are these guys? These are the generals who made it to the top uh, of the army simply because they enjoyed Mubarak's confidence. Logger and labor activist Hassan Hamalawi, who's been fighting the Mubarak regime for years, is convinced the generals were against them from the start. Don't you think that the, uh, that the Supreme Council for the Armed Forces wouldn't have loved to nuke us in Tahrir during you the revolution? So? Oh, yeah. I mean, if it was up to them, if they could have gotten away with it, they would have nuked us. But why didn't they do that? Because they knew that the soldiers and the conscripts and the young officers they sent to us in Tahrir, they wouldn't have opened fire because they are just as oppressed as us. Having the generals in control was not what the protesters had in mind. After Mubarak had left and the world thought the revolution was over, they reoccupied the square demanding to be heard. A month later, the generals had heard enough. They insisted they would clear the place of demonstrators and thugs. Troops 
invaded the square, rounded up hundreds of activists. They spotted the troubadour, Rami Yassam, and without explanation, dragged him a hundred yards to the Egyptian museum, where they'd set up a prison. They began feeding him with clubs and steel rods, and that was just for starters. The officers were jumping on your back. And, and on my head. And on your head. Th that's happened for uh, about two hours? They were doing this for two hours? Yes. His head was face down in the dirt. He wasn't moving. Then, a senior officer came by. I, I heard him say, that, where is Romy? And when he came to me um, and, and saw me, um, he, he told them, he is still alive. Do you think he really thought you might be dead? Yes, because they, they, they touched me very badly. And you weren't moving? OK, so then the officer left. And did they leave you alone then? No. They started to electrocute me. They electrocuted you? Yeah. With a cattle prod? Yes. Where did they put the prod? Um, and, and over all my body. When they'd finished, they shoved him into a can. When his friends found him, this is what they saw. And remember, this was happening a month after Mubarak had left. When I was tortured, I decided to, to be silent and calm to make them angry. You never said, please stop. It's amazing. When they were torturing you, you didn't scream? No. Um, I just decide to be silent. One can decide to do many things, but one is not always capable of doing these things. How could they be hurting you so badly and you didn't make any noise? No. And, and by the way, I, I, was, I was shocked from what they, they, they do. You were shocked? Because they are Egyptian. And these Egyptians are treating detainees the way they did when Mubarak was in charge. This video was placed on YouTube two weeks ago. The military said it would investigate the incident. On Tuesday night, this is what happened to a Coptic Christian who'd been protesting a Muslim attack on a church. The footage was also placed on YouTube. When Mubarak left, you're smart. You knew that things weren't going to get very much better very quickly. But did you believe that things were going to get this bad? No, no. I didn't think it was going to be this bad. I thought it was, I thought it was going to be a long road, but I thought it, was, it would be less painful. 25-year-old Mona Sif has been marching along that road since the very first day. She's leading the campaign against military trials, which has become the rallying cry of the revolution. More than 12,000 civilians have been arrested and tried in military courts since February for everything from thuggery to threatening the security of the Egyptian state. So what happens in a military trial? Uh, it's very rapid, it's very quick. What do you mean by rapid? Rapid, I mean that most of the cases we know they get arrested, they get sentenced in three days. Three days? Yes. Most what of kind days. of legal representation do they have? Uh, in many of the cases, the regular, the real lawyers were not allowed, were not uh, allowed to access the courtroom. So it's a sham? It's a sham. Mona and her colleagues have interviewed dozens of families of the detainees and put their testimonies up on the web. All the families know is that their relatives are missing. They know nothing about charges, verdicts, or sentences. When you accuse the army of military trials, the army says, look, these are exceptional times. We need exceptional measures. We don't need exceptional measures. If you talk to professional legal personnel, they will tell you our legal system is capable of handling this. And it's very obvious that their method has not done anything because the thugs are not behind bars. It's the poor people who are behind bars. It's the revolutionaries. It's people who dare to stand up against the regime. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We asked members of the regime for an interview. They declined. Defense Secretary Panetta met with the generals this week. Afterwards, Panetta said they did not tell him when they would hand over power to a civilian government or when they would lift the state of emergency or end military trials. But he did not sound discouraged. I, have, uh, I really do have full confidence in the process that the Egyptian military is overseeing. 
Uh, I think they're making good progress. The Egyptian military receives $1.3 billion a year from the United States and owns huge chunks of the Egyptian economy. Are they going to give all that up? No, they are not. But that's what a revolution is all about. You know, no elite in any country, no rulers in any country would give up power very easily. No, but don't you agree that the next president of Egypt is going to be a lot better than Mubarak? Well, if they elect me as the next president even of Egypt, I won't be able to do anything. It's not about the figures. It's about the regime. It's about the system. It's a river, the Nile, which brought Egypt to life. And for 7,000 years, this oasis of a nation has been ruled by pharaohs, dictators, conquerors, and kings. But democracy, it's never been here. So it's got to be considered a long shot. But then again, there's never been a revolution in Egypt. And once a revolution gets going, it's not always easy to make it stop. Millions of workers are on strike in almost every sector of the economy. Teachers, students, bus drivers, engineers, they all have the same demands, a sharp increase in wages and the removal of their bosses, Mubarak's cronies, who are still in charge. And Rami Yassam? Like so many others, he has simply forgotten how to be afraid. He's back in Tahrir Square performing. Same tune, different lyrics. Instead of down with Hosni Mubarak, he's singing down with military rule. Is that wise? Is that a smart thing to do? I, I just want Egypt to be better. You want just, Egypt to be better? I just want to take my freedom. And they may take you away again yeah. and do what they did before, maybe even worse. What happened to me make me believe that um, they are the bad guys, not us. We are right, they are wrong. It's that simple.